this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. Everybody, you've been asking for this one. Everybody has been asking me, writing me emails, calling me. Pastor, where is the other part of the Watchman video on the rapture and the number five? It's right here. I'm doing it right now. It's actually, it's been... It's been like I've added all the ingredients in a pot, put them all together, and they've just been simmering, stewing. You know, when you like you make chili, you make a good stew or whatever, you don't eat it right away. Because all the flavors and all the aromas, they got to get in there and jiggle against one another and, you know, learn how to get along and give you this fantastic, oh, this great thing. I'm not so sure that anything that I say it's going to be all that great. But when I give scripture and when you see the patterns, the way that God moves, the way that God designed everything in this universe and designed the way that he does everything. When you see that in relation to the translation, the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, when you see those patterns, you just, you stand in awe of a God that, according to his own word, never changes. What he did yesterday, what he does today, it's what he's going to do tomorrow, okay? God is a God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not another God back in this time, and he does it this way. Now he does it this way and he's a completely different God. No, that's, that's for other gods that they want to be that way. But our God is the same, all right? And w when you see patterns, I mean, everything about life shows structure and order and cyclical patterns. The fact that the sun rose today, just like it did yesterday and just like it did a year ago this very day. And you get a farmer's almanac, you can look in there and they've got it all written out exactly when the sun's going to rise, when it's going to set, no matter what day, where the moon's going to be, where the stars are going to be, um, where all the planets are going to be, where everything's going to be, because God works in order. The thing that hath been is that which shall be. And getting to know God from His Word, to me, one of the greatest, not just the greatest thrill of life, but to me, the truest journey of life is in this life, spending as much time as we can, getting to know as much about our God as we can. You see, our God is not like that strange woman. You know, the one in the book of Proverbs I talk about all the time. Read Proverbs. Yeah, read the whole thing. Read the book of Proverbs. You see two women in there, okay? One's a real nice lady. She's very wise. She is very discreet. She's very chaste. She's very pure. It's a very lovely woman. It's a woman that you would love to be your grandma or your sister or your wife. But then there's the other woman, okay? She's strange. Okay, and not just, you know, a little weird. I mean, she's out of it. The Bible says of her that her ways, book of Proverbs, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. What does that tell you? That if in your mind your God does something strange that he has, A, never said that he was going to do, B, never done anything like it before, I'm just telling you, you know, even like, you know, I know there's not ever been like another rapture where all these saints have flown up in the air and gone into heaven, but we've had something similar to that. And Jesus told us that those things in the scripture are like this, like as it was in the days of Noah. Well, what did God do? He saved his people from his wrath. That's essentially what we're talking about when we're talking about the rapture. Okay. So he hasn't raptured everybody yet. But he's done similar things, and he said, see how I did that? That's how I'm going to do this. So he's a God of order, okay? And his ways are 
knowable. They're in patterns. And in particular, the pattern that we've been looking into is the, the number five, okay? And I was just, I sat down here, got my, got my notes ready, and I opened my Bible up, and it was at 2 second, uh, Thessalonians 2, and I, I knew that 2 Thessalonians 2 was describing the appearance of Jesus Christ in the air to receive his people unto himself. It says, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Bada boom, bada bing. That's the translation. That's the rapture. That's what he's talking about. Look, notice what he says. There's patterns here. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. Is that the, see that? Is that the day of Christ is at hand. Okay? Now you say, oh, oh, uh, Hang with me. Let's go back. I'm not going to redo the whole first video, even though it's been months ago. But let's kind of get the two main verses that really describe the translation, the rapture. First Thessalonians, it went way past it. First Thessalonians chapter 4. We all know that one. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Let's look at it, and then we'll break down these patterns, all right? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive, and I don't see that word then, you know, it shows you an order. God's going to do this first, then that. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Remember that. To meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 18, one of my favorite passages concerning the rapture. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Remember, as is our custom, as Bible-believing Christians. We love to beat each other up about what we believe, don't we? Hey, sometimes even like, you know, physically beating people up. I've seen it happen. We tend to argue over things, over a thing that has not happened yet. To me, it's plainly revealed in Scripture and we argue about that. We argue about the timing of it. We argue about whether there's one or there's two. Or we argue, some even say, well, that's, that's already happened. Or that's the resurrection or whatever. I mean, we love to beat each other up over our various rapture views, don't we? I've done it. I mean, I've gone after people. Oh, you idiots, you don't. Get... Okay? We're not supposed to do that, people. Brethren, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to comfort one another with these words. You see somebody having a bad day, everything is gone from them, and it's like they have no hope. Go to them and say, wouldn't it be great if today or tomorrow the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wouldn't that be great if that happened today? Comfort. Comfort is a scripture word. We through patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope. My purpose here with this is to not try to prove how everybody is wrong about the rapture. My purpose here, show you the Word of God. The purpose of any pastor, any preacher, any Bible teacher is to not draw people to themselves. Oh no, the purpose is to draw attention to the Lord Jesus Christ through the pages of His Holy Bible. It is to awaken us to His Word and the amazing, wondrous things that are in his word. I mean, look at it like this. I mentioned Stu a while ago, okay? You know, you can eat just plain old raw potatoes if you want, okay? And they'll do you some good, but they're a whole lot better with real butter, baked, mashed, a little salt and pepper, maybe a little garlic. I mean, they're just, they're just better that way, right? Um, 
you know, eating a cow, I like eating cow. There are some things from a cow that are better than others and they taste better and especially when you use some things to draw out some of those natural flavors of beef. Ooh. So that's what I want to do. What I want to do is I want to show you, just reading the Bible is good for you. But sometimes we need savor, don't we? Sometimes we want something sweet. Sometimes we want something salty. Sometimes we want something a little sour. Sometimes it's just, that's, that's our needs and our spiritual needs likewise. It helps us when men of God, even you ladies, can make the Bible savory, sweet, or a little salty, or just wonderful. That's what I want to do, is to make this Bible savory to you so that it's delicious. To, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And when you taste this, you'll want more. And it's better rather than me, you coming to me to cook it up for you every time. Be a whole lot easier on me and you both if you'd learn how to cook some yourself. Amen? All right, back to this. Number five, let's go look at the pattern here of five. Number one, he's going to come with a shout. Number two, the voice of the archangel. Number three, the trump of God. Number four, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then number five, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, when years ago when I started counting things in the Bible, and I started seeing a list. Every time I'd see a list, I'd go, okay, that's a list. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, and I would count them. And God was showing me what these numbers were. If you remember, one of the first things that we saw in the last video, you have to go back and watch it, is we went to the fifth chapter of the Bible. What's in there? Enoch. What's up with Enoch? He was alive 365 years, and then he is with God in Hebrews 11 verse says that God took him. God translated him. Okay? And how? By faith. He pleased God by faith. And God translated him from this world up there without dying. And so, you know, I started seeing this number related to things about the rapture and the translation. And I'm using that word translation because we're not just going to be caught up in the air. We are going to be, according to 1 Corinthians 15, changed. A transformation is going to take place. This body, gone. Thank God. The new body, now it is what we inhabit, what we are. And that eternal body will never fade, never die, uh, will never get, will not be making any pimple popping videos in heaven, okay? And so anyway, this is all about a transformation. Now, as we get into this further, we're going to see on Satan's side, well, he's got a little transformation plan himself, right? You know that? The number fits both ways. We're going to see it, God transforming us, and we're going to see it, Satan transforming not just everybody else on the planet, but himself. That number, okay? Then I mentioned 1 Corinthians 15, the two verses. And it was odd to me when I first was looking at it that both of them had the same number. There was a list here. Paul didn't speak in one straight sentence. The little commas in there. One of my teachers early in seventh grade, she's, we had to learn how to diagram sentences. Remember that? Noun, verb, and all that stuff. And we complained about it because we didn't like to do it. And she said, if you complain, I'll pick some verses out of the Apostle Paul's writing, just one verse, and have you diagram. Some of those verses, some of those sentences that the Apostle Paul wrote are like four verses long. She said, I'll make you diagram those. No, we're good. Thank you. Okay. But Paul spoke in that same pattern, in the order of God, because it was God's words. And you'll see that pattern. There's a list there. And you count them. There's five. Behold, I show you a mystery. By the way, stop right here. Remember the last video, the word mystery? Get our Pure Bible Search software, purebiblesearch.com. Type in the word mystery and count. Find the fifth occurrence of the word mystery. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Now, is that a coincidence? Is that something that 
just happens to be that way. You can, you can believe that if you want. I mean, and I'm serious. I'm not being sarcastic. If you don't really, this number stuff, that, that's fine, okay? But I personally don't think that anything in my Bible is coincidental without having an attachment to a plan of God, an idea of God. In other words, because this word, mystery, it's an important word in the Bible. This word mystery, at its fifth occurrence, is mentioning not the salvation of the Jews, not the mystery of Christ on the cross, but the mystery of our translation. To me, that's significant. I, I know God is way smarter than I am, and when they printed the King James Bible, God didn't go, hey, look, look, at, look how that worked out. The word mystery is like in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. That's like the fifth. God didn't do that. God didn't go, oh, wow, that's cool. Huh. I wonder if Mike Hargard will ever pick up on that. Dun -dun -dun. Yeah, I'm in one of those moods. God knew it. God knew it. God knew it before he, we knew anything. God knew that this word would be in this verse, in this place, to say that God designed it that way, well, that's a no-brainer. There is nothing, there is nothing around anywhere that God did not ordain and design. This whole universe and everything that's in it, by His Word, from His Word, through His Word, and about His Word is all in order. And God knows it. All right? So, here's the, back to the verse here. Here's the, here's the number five. Behold, I show you a mystery. That's one of them. We shall not all sleep. Let's count. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's the second one. In a moment, there's another comma there. In the twinkling of an eye, there's another comma there. At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed. So here it is. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Trump. Okay, so we have the, the two verses that you can think of that you know explains exactly what's going to happen in the translation. Day of our transformation, the day of our rapture, being caught up, okay? Both of them have that same order. See what I'm doing here? Okay, I have two hands, one, two. They both have five fingers, don't they? They are a little different from each other. They're not oppositional to one another. They are complementary. They work together. But the fact that both of my hands, the two witnesses, both have 27 bones apiece. They both have five fingers exactly. Now, that in itself doesn't prove the rapture in the number five. Well, it kind of plays into it. But anyway, you get what I'm saying here. We have two verses, and they both have that same pattern in it. So, if we were to stop right here, we might, we might say that might be coincidental. It might not have any other relevant meaning. But let's look further at things that would be number five. Like uh, we could, we're going to go in a little bit to the fifth book of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, there's things that I saw in Deuteronomy since I made this last video on this to the praise of God Almighty that just wows me. And, and really, that's, you know, when I did the last part, I thought, you know, I want to study Deuteronomy more with this in mind, and I did, and I'm just going, this is amazing. So we could go to the fifth book of the Old Testament and see if there's something there that's related to the translation. Why don't we, and we're going to do that in a minute, why don't we go to the fifth book of the New Testament, right? So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they do, they do something very, very well. They explain in detail the birth, the ministry, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he's not still here on the earth, is he? Where did he go? Heaven. How did he get there? A cloud. In what book 
did he go in? The book of Acts. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And look down at the bottom there, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. We're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds. Look at that. Same thing as Christ. Behold, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And that's in the fifth book of the New Testament. Very first chapter. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus. Look at that which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Where are we going to meet him? In the clouds, when he comes in the clouds. Where are we going to meet the dead in Christ? In the clouds. Where, how are we going to get there? We're going to be taken up. We're going to be caught up just like Jesus was. So we have uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, pattern number 5. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52, pattern of number five, two of them actually. And then we have this one. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Jesus did not ascend in the first four Gospels. He's still here on the earth. It's not until the very beginning of the fifth book of the Bible. And again, this in itself is not doctrine. What it is, is the order of that shows the handiwork of God. It's like looking at a sculptor or, or, or a painting or maybe a, a piece of music. And I, I like to, I used to do this with my kids when they were little, we'd listen to classical music and they'd say, okay, dad, who, who is that? And I'd listen to it for a while and I'd say, that's uh, Tchaikovsky. It was Tchaikovsky. Okay, dad, who is this? Okay, it was uh, Mozart. And then it was like Carl Phil, Philip Emanuel Bach because he kind of wrote like Mozart. But anyway, so everybody that does things has a signature to what they do it. This is God's signature. This is God saying, this is, I'm God. I do everything in order. I do it right. And I'm the same yesterday, today, forever. So I think there's always going to be this pattern associated with the rapture and the number five. So now let's go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter one, first chapter. Because, and follow the order here, <clears throat> we have Abraham in Genesis, Moses in Exodus, leading the people out of Egypt. They spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness, and, they went, and that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, okay? And you can kind of see the proto-gospel in those four books. You have, uh, like in Genesis, you have, the, you have Adam, you have Matthew, in the book of Matthew, you have the the second Adam. Uh, in the first four books of the Old Testament, you have uh, the story of God's salvation and how it's going to be. A Passover lamb, blood being applied, a sacrifice, an atonement. All of those things are mentioned. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then in Deuteronomy. Moses has now gotten them as far as he can take them because Moses, the law, cannot take you across Jordan's river. You cannot go to heaven by the law. We try it, and it doesn't. We fail. It's not the law that's bad. We're the bad. So Moses cannot lead them, but he can see it. God showed it to him. And he explains to Moses in the fifth book of the Bible what he is going to give as an inheritance to his people. What are we, what are we going to get? We're going to get our inheritance. This is our father who's going to give us this land of heaven free of charge simply because we are his son. So look at it. Deuteronomy 1.8, Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. Look at verse 10, The Lord your God, look at this, hath multiplied you, and behold, ye are this day as what? The stars of heaven for multitude. Do you remember that, and I didn't put it in my notes here, do you remember that passage where Paul was talking about that um, we are going to be manifest as the sons of God and we will shine as lights in the world? Are you kidding me? We're going to be as the stars of heaven, like the angels. That's what Jesus said, right? That's what he's saying here. I have, look, look at them now. Behold. Year as the stars of heaven for multitude. 
that's what's coming for us. So they, they did all of the sacrificing, all the beginning, and all the wandering. 40 years in the first four books, but they're still on the other side of Jordan. It's not until the fifth book, Moses dies, then they can go to the other side. That's when Joshua, like the second Moses, right? The second coming, he leads them into the promised land, not Moses, okay? Uh, keep going in Deuteronomy. I'm not done. Deuteronomy 10, 22, thy fathers went down into Egypt with, look at this, <laughs> Three score and ten persons, uh, that's seventy. And now the Lord thy God hath made thee again as the stars of heaven for multitude. Now, stop right here. Patterns, right? The thing that hath been is that which shall be. God always, he always does it in order with patterns, with the sun rising, the sun going down, the sun rising, the sun going down, month after month, year after year, day after day, it's the same thing. It's because it's from the same God. We don't wake up on a different, well, some of us don't wake up on a different planet every day. We don't wake up uh, it, with the earth, you know, four billion light years away in a different universe altogether. That's not how it works. It's all the same every day. So watch this. In the Old Testament, it started out with 70 people, okay? The last part of Genesis, first part of Exodus, 70 people that became the stars of heaven, right? That's fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy. Luke 10, remember that? After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place where their himself would come. New Testament starts out with 70 people, right? Turns into what? What the church is today and when we are translated, we'll be as the stars of heaven. Isn't that, I went, look at this. I smiled. I thank God that, you know, he just like clicked, Mike, look at this. And I went, oh, look at that. What he did in the Old Testament started out with 70, then they became the stars. Same thing in New Testament. Started out with 70. They became the star. We, we are going to become the stars of heaven for multitude. Fifth book of the Bible. Not done. Deuteronomy 11. Verse 10. For the land where thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt. Thank God. From when she came out. Where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. In other words, we had to work. We have to work on this earth. But the land where you go to possess it is the land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year, even unto the end of the year. Doesn't that sound beautiful? Look at Deuteronomy 12, 9. For ye are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance, which the Lord your God giveth you. But when ye go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit, and when he giveth you rest from all your enemies round about, so that ye dwell in safety. Paul wrote, or yeah, I think it was Paul. I think Paul wrote Hebrews. I just, I don't know. It just smells like Paul. Um, Paul mentioned here about, let's see, was it Hebrews, um, I think it was Hebrews 8, or 8 9, or 10, where he talks about there's a rest that's still coming. Maybe earlier than that. Yeah, in Hebrews 4. Um, For he spake of a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and, to, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief, so on, so on, so on. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. That's verse 9, chapter 4. There remaineth a rest to the people of God. And that's what he's saying here. He has not yet come to the rest and to the inheritance. Not yet. There's a river. And I really believe this. I believe that when God divided the, the waters above from the waters below, it would be hard, it'd be impossible to explain it any better or different than the way the Bible describes it, like the River Jordan that is separating us 
from that land. I mean, think about it. If you look at a map and put your finger on Egypt, they could have walked up the Mediterranean coast in a matter of probably a month and said, okay, we're here. It would have been the easiest thing. To that is not what God did. God made them go from Egypt all, and I'm looking at a map here, so I'm going to do it backwards for you. Here's Egypt. God made them go all the way, let's see, they would be going east and come back around on the other side of Jordan so that they could go from east to west into the promised land, crossing the river Jordan, like the sun, east to west, okay? And um, you know, see, that was pretty good. We were going with it. But anyway, the, God could have easily put them in there, but God had a way. He wanted them to cross that river Jordan. And I think that shows, it's like Israel going to see God at Mount Sinai. How did they get there? They had to cross the sea. And I think that there is a firmament of water that is separating and maybe not even like the water like on this earth, like spirit water that is separating us from there. And one of these days, God's going to open that way so we can enter into his rest that he's offered us. Fifth book of the Bible. Read it, okay? How about this one? I'll give you part of a verse here. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Where's that? Guess where it is? Fiftieth book of the Bible. Philippians 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we're looking for him. Who shall change our vile body body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself look at your bible think about it number one remember this idea of transformation change first corinthians 15 that's what it was all about going from this mortal flesh this wicked nasty stinky thing that god gave us thank you god to the next one to the new body a transformation must take place. God is the one who transforms us. The word of God transforms us. Moses telling the people, or God telling Moses, see, you started out with 70, right? Now look at them, stars of heaven. Transformation. We are going to shine as lights in the, world, uh, uh, in the darkness of this world by Christ who is described in the Old Testament as the star, capital S that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Think of him like the son, son of righteousness. And even though we would be starred like the stars of heaven, you can't see the stars for the sun. Okay? That's, and that's how it's supposed to be. Amen? Oh, I isn't this great? I mean, if you don't, even if you don't like the number part of this, the beauty of what God is saying here in this King James Bible, there, there is no book in the world that can touch what this book says and how it says it, and how it's revealing to us this transformation, 50th book of the Bible. We've got to move on. Hebrews chapter 2. Now watch this. Remember, Satan also, because when we started out st studying this number 5 in the previous video, we noted that the initial patterns of the number 5 pointed to death. A guy told me that, yeah, and I didn't believe him. And I went and studied that. I went going, that guy is pretty smart. Genesis 5, fifth chapter of the Bible, right? You have Adam. You have his son, um, Seth, and then uh, Enos, and then uh, Canaan, and then Mahalaleel, and then all, of, anyway, all those children. And every time they're mentioned, mentioned five times in Genesis chapter 5, and the fifth time they're mentioned, they die. And that is a, just a continuing pattern. Guess who breaks it? Enoch breaks the pattern. Guess who else breaks it? Because it mentions Lamech, right? It mentions Lamech. And the fifth time Lamech is mentioned, and all the days of Lamech were 770 and seven years, and he died. There it is again. But then the fifth time Noah's name is mentioned uh, is verse 8 of chapter 6. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And you know how old he was then? 500. 
I love it. But anyway, the, well, I was getting, the point I was getting at in Deuteronomy, that's where Moses does what? Dies. Moses wrote the law, first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. The New Testament calls it the law of sin and death. He said, the law is good. We're not. And because of it, there's a penalty, and it's death. So the idea of that transformation in the rapture is that here we are appointed to die because Adam, here's Adam being mentioned five times in Genesis 5, and the fifth time he dies, and so here we are in Adam, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. That's Romans. Okay? You'll look at it. So then, let's take this idea of death. We're going to be transformed from death to life. That's our second birth. Satan is going to transform everybody from their first death to what the Bible calls the false prophets, twice dead. You know what that means? It means literally they are like this night of the living dead. They're zombies. Okay? No, they don't have their eyeball hanging out and half their arms eaten off, stuff like that. They are so dead that they cannot be reasoned with. They will not change. They, are, they have been appointed unto this death, and there's no sense arguing with them. Okay? Now, I'm not sure I know everybody who is already twice dead. But there are many false prophets in the world, and I'm pretty sure some of them are. So let's take this idea and now look at Satan, okay, and this idea of transformation. Hebrews 2.14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Now think about it. First four books of the New Testament, Christ died, each one of them. He rose again, fifth book of the New Testament, he's gone up into heaven in a cloud, and he's coming back the exact same way to receive us. It's all that number five. And remember, purebiblesearch.com. Get the Pure Bible Search software or go to webchannel.purebiblesearch.com, I think. And you can put that, use that on your mobile, okay? Uh, your tablet or your phone or whatever. It doesn't matter if it's Google or iOS or whatever. You type in the word Satan, not Satan or Satan's with apostrophe S or whatever. Type in the word Satan 55 times exactly. And again, did God know that? Sure he did. Did he establish it? Did he ordain it? Did God do it? I have to believe he did. Simply because of the overwhelming amount of numerical patterns in the Bible. And it's not complicated stuff. Like you got to know pi to the 1,000th thing in order to figure this out. You just read and count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Looky there. Okay, it's that simple. So Isaiah 14, look at this. So we have Satan here. Because uh, Christ is, through death, destroys him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, okay? Satan, 55 times. Isaiah 14, 12, look at this. Because we're going to understand just how right our Bible is in naming Satan as not morning star, not day star, brr, Lucifer. Watch this. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou uh, hast said in thine heart, let's go to that next slide, let's look at that pattern. Number one, I will ascend into heaven. Look at that pentagram. One, two, three, four, five. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. You know what just occurred to me? I'm not kidding you. Well, you know what just occurred to me? Look at this. Look at, look at what Christ has promised us. Here we are on this earth. We're held down by gravity, which means we weigh too much, and on and on and on. We want to be in heaven. Where is it? Is it east, west? Is It's up. So God promised us that we are going to ascend 
into heaven. God also promised us as his saints that we would be judging angels. Look at that next one. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Dun, dun, dun. Number three, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Do you know where that is? It is heavenly. The book of Psalms, I can't, I can't remember the exact verse scripture. But mount, the, look at the phrase sides of the north. Because it says, I think, almost identical in the book of Psalms and identifies Mount Zion in the sides of the north where his congregation is. Okay, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to you know, be ruling as God. I'm not saying that. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. We're going to meet Jesus in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I will be like the Most High. I'm not saying we're going to be God, but we're go we, we just saw, uh, where was it? Philippians 3, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we're going to, do Lucifer's plan. What I think, I'm, and I'm just thinking this through in my mind right now, what I think I see here is God has given us a place with him in heaven. It is, we will ascend into heaven. We will be judging angels. Therefore, we will be sitting on thrones judging angels. That's what the Bible says, verbatim. That means word for word, Tim, okay? We're going to be exalted above the angels in heaven. Um, we definitely are the congregation and we'll be with Jesus in Mount Zion in heaven in the sides of the north or the north side. Look at e Ezekiel chapter 1 because uh, that's where apparently it's not Santa Claus up there in the north. Okay, It is... Um, Verse 4 of Ezekiel 1, I looked and behold a whirlwind came out of the north. Okay? So, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. What I'm saying is, doctrinally, in our translation, at our death, at the resurrection, we will be granted, we will be granted pretty much all of this. Isn't it great? There's somebody wanting our place. He wants to rule over us, he wants to, and look at it. Satan doesn't say what we say. We don't say, God, I'm coming up there, and I'm going to sit on the throne up there, and I'm going to be like you. We don't say that to God. We come, God, bawling our eyes out, God, will you please, will you please let us into heaven? Right? That's not the dragon. The dragon's going, oh, I'm going to do it, and you can't stop me. He's arrogant. He's full of pride and very just. He's going to try to take the place that has been granted to Christ and his body, us. You see, I just, first time, I'm not kidding you. I'm just seeing that right now. So do you see, you see something going on here? Something very evil, something very diabolical. I see it. I get it. And it's all this same pattern, this same number. Remember, he has the power over death. So he's going to, he's the one that helps people over to the other side. I hear, I am the angel. Remember, remember the movie, A City of Angels, where Seth was this angel that walked these little dead children into heaven, you know, where their puppies are waiting them. And oh, it's a wonderful place. The one, the, the one who really has power over death comes and grabs people, throws them into hellfire. Okay? He's got that power. 2 Corinthians 11, look at this. 5 is about transformation, change. 1 Corinthians 15 taught us that. Remember the word Lucifer, what it means. Messenger, bearer of light. I have light, I'm bringing it to you like the moon. 
The moon is a bearer of light. It brings the light from the sun, reflects off of it, shines it down on the earth. Okay? So watch this. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is, here's the word, transformed into what? Da, 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 an angel of light. You, you know what the word angel means? Messenger, bearer, bringer of light. See, the translators, the King James, and I don't exalt these men as some super holy saint Christians that never do anything wrong, and they're like 40,000 levels above everybody else. They're wicked, low-down, hell-deserving sinners just like the rest of us. So was King James. I don't care how many pearls and rubies his boots have on, he puts them on the same way you and I do. Care how many diadems he has and crowns and all that stuff. He was a human flesh just like you and I. But God used these men. God used these men. And God gave these men special wisdom because they were fulfilling the scripture. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and let one interpret. They were fulfilling a very, very specific and important role of God to make sure, by way of the Holy Ghost, that this Bible was correctly translated into English for us, and for everybody else that we can talk to, for us in this day. Okay? So they chose the word Lucifer. Do they just pull it out of thin air? Do they just make it up? Some say, well, Satan's name really isn't Lucifer. Really? Ask the Satan worshipers. They know who it is, okay? Lucifer means bearer of light, messenger of light, angel of light. It matches 2 Corinthians 11, 14, because that's what he's transformed into. Now, th again, think about it. What are we going to be transformed into? The image of Christ and his glorious body. You know what glorious is, right? Like light shooting out of it, so bright. You can't even look at the sun. Jesus sh outshines the sun, right? So we're going to be changed in that manner. We are going to be angels of light in every way shape and form what does satan try to do i mean think about it god made man a little lower than the angels and anybody that you think is beneath you tell me what you think about them not much do you i mean we all have it in us right sure you do okay how does he see us how does the devil see us I think he sees us walking past him, ascending up into heaven, judging angels, ascending above the heights of the clouds, made in the fashion of the glorious body of Jesus Christ. And he says, you filthy dogs, you're beneath me. I deserve that place. I deserve that seat. So he thinks he can take it by transformed, being transformed into an angel of light. And look at verse 15. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be what? Transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their work. So it's not just Satan here in this number five in his transformation. Everybody that follows him. The number five. Go back and look at that pentagram. How often do we see that now? I mean, a lot. You know, since the days of ACDC, right? You see people with pentagram tattoos, pentagram clothing, pentagram earrings, pentagram this, pentagram that. I mean, it's like cool to have a satanic sign, you know, placed on your body. Everybody's worshiping this symbol of the pentagram. It's being, it's just like the hexagon, 666alert.net. Go to that website, you'll see what I'm talking about. There's sixes everywhere. I'm not making this up. Three, you'll see patterns of three, six, three hexagons all grouped together. That's 666. Why? Anyway. Pentagrams everywhere. What does it mean? It's about transformation. It's about people being transformed. I'll show you. Um, 
I'll show you this in Scripture. How about Matthew, since I believe there are patterns in the Bible. 23 is the number for death. So let's go to the 23rd chapter of the New Testament, shall we? Boy, we are having fun, aren't we? Um, let's see here. Matthew 23. He's talking to the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. And um, let's see here. He talks about them devouring widows' houses and, and for pretense making long prayer, receiving greater damnation. Look at verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. In other words, to change somebody, one disciple, transforming their mind, transforming the way they think. A baby doesn't come out of the womb and say, I love Lucifer, I'm going to be a Satan worshiper. No, that takes a process of changing their mind. So watch this. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. See, we're already born into condemnation, right? That's a child of hell. The Pharisees and their false doctrine, their leaven, I think the word leaven is like 23 times King James Bible. Matthew 23. Anyway, their doctrine and their leaven puffeth up. And by the time they're done, that convert has been transformed into a second-born child of hell. You see, the Bible also talks about, since we're chasing this rabbit, we're going to chase him all the way to the end. The Bible also talks about 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Look at an image of Baphomet on the internet, okay? See these two fingers here? It's two and three, okay? Look at this, 1 Peter 1, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed. That's Satan. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth for ever so being born again twofold child of hell okay there is a transformation coming that is absolutely without any doubt and beyond any question is going to instantaneously transform everybody on the earth as a child as as a totally damned forever twofold twice born child of hell and it's going to take place by way of corruptible seed compare what god told adam in genesis 2 to what satan told eve in genesis 3 what god told adam is incorruptible what satan told eve was corruptible and it corrupted her and it corrupted her offspring that would be me and now he's going to seal the deal because right now there's redemption right but if someone who is twice dead there is no redemption there is only damnation satan is going to make sure that everybody he can is going to be twice dead born again of corruptible seed twofold a child of hell see to me it makes sense so whether this five pattern leads you to God's transformation of us or Satan's transformation, number one, of himself, and number two, of everybody else. The number still sounds. The number still exists. Joshua. Let's go to Joshua, okay? Joshua chapter 10, verse 22. Then said Joshua, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. This is, this is a story now. And I'm going to set use these verses to set up where we're going it involves trumpets guess how many and they did so and they brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave the king of jerusalem the king of hebron the king of jarmuth the king of lachish and the king of eglon so look at revelation chapter 9 the fifth angel sounded and i saw a star fall from heaven under the earth i wonder who that could be 
And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And what did he do? He opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the or smoke of a good poker game. Dun, dun, okay, it was just a joke. Okay. The smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power. Look at there. As the scorpions of the earth have power. Think about it. Where do the scorpions of the earth have their power? I mean, you know scorpions, right? Two things noteworthy about scorpions. They have chopsticks on the front, right? And a backside that you don't want nothing to do with. In fact, I dealt with one scorpion one time in my life in Oklahoma. It was in my dorm room in college. And I thought that hell had been unleashed on us. Never had to deal with a little scorpion. I mean, it was, the thing was that big. And I wasn't afraid of its little legs. Wasn't afraid of its little chopsticks. I didn't want anything to do with that stinger. Nothing. Okay? So we captured it and we put it in the freezer and froze it to death. Okay? Kept, we'd, we'd open it up say, look what we found! Okay, college, I get it. So watch this. The power of these scorpions is in their tail. What is in their tail? Think about the word. Think about the word the Bible uses. Now, here's what I'm doing. The kings, these five kings in Joshua 10, the reason why there's five, they represent these spirits. Peter talked about it. Jude talked about it. The angels that sinned, God put them in chains under darkness, held them there. I think here they're being released out. So these five kings represent what happens at the fifth trumpet. The trumpet sounds these kings because if I, let me remember right here. I'm just, I'm get, getting revelation from God here. Um, these scorpions, yeah, verse 7, the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold. Interesting. So here we have five kings, and they were giants. And then we have these beasts coming up out of the bottomless pit with crowns on their heads at the fifth trumpet. The cave represents the pit that the kings were in. Now the cave is being opened, and who wanted it? Who let it open? Joshua did. Joshua is Jesus. Jesus who has the key to the bottomless pit right now? Jesus does. He says, I have the keys of hell and death. You want, you want to open that door? Yeah, come to me because I'm the only one that's got the key. There's only one key and I got it. So this angel, this star, whoever you think it is, if, if you think it's Satan, I think it's Satan. If you want to think it's Michael Jackson, think it's Michael Jackson. But anyway, a star falls from heaven. To him was given the key. He didn't steal it. It was given to him. Here's Jesus. I can just, here's Jesus. Hey, Satan. You want it? gives it to him. What does he do immediately? I need help. And he opens up that pit. But see, God wanted that open. God wanted that open. Number one, he's going to use them to judge this earth. Number two, it's like going from jail, going to the courthouse, going right to the executioner's chair. Because that's what's happening here. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 10. It came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. I love that. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. Remember this, number five. And afterward Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. And it came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded, and they took them down off the trees and cast them into the cave wherein they had been hid and laid great stones in the cave's mouth, which remaineth unto this very day. You see, not only do I see a picture here, Revelation 9, I see a picture of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. 
Christ took on himself death. That's what that number five means. These kings represent our enemies. You, you know who our last enemy is? Death. Christ took on himself death. And they pierced him. One, two, three, four, five. Hanging on the cross. And he died. And before the sun went down on Christ, they took him down. After they smoked Christ. They slew him, hanged him on a tree. They took him down before the going down of the sun, put him in a cave where it enrolled great, a great stone, right? Those stones of these kings are still there. Christ's stone rolled away. Isn't that beautiful? Christ, Christ defeated death by doing what? Dying. You ever wondered what, if you get the Bible search software, you can do things like this. You can, there's a little, little deal here. You press on it, and it's got, you know, the list of numbers from 1 to 1189. Because that's how many chapters are in the Bible. So if you wanted to go to, say, the 30th chapter, of the Bible, well, that's Genesis 30, that's easy. But if, if you wanted, for some odd reason, wanted to go to the 930th chapter of the Bible, that's how old Adam was. That's Matthew chapter 1, second Adam. And you can do that by just scrolling down, click, click, whatever. If you wanted to find out the 500th chapter of the Bible, it's easy. Get the software, it's free of charge. We don't track you, okay? We just like to know approximately where some of, the, some of the people have downloaded that software from places where we suspect it is illegal to have a Bible. And I hope that they downloaded it and read it. And all they have to do to hide it is go click and it's gone, okay? And then read it again, anyway. I love, I love what God has done. 500th chapter of the Bible. You know how it starts? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? No, it's not in Matthew. It's Psalm 22, 500th chapter of the Bible. Look at this. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Psalm 22, 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Look what's in the 500th chapter of the Bible. Christ died being pierced, hanging on a tree like the kings here, thrown into a cave, rolled a great stone, stone rolls back the third day, rises from the dead. He conquered death in his death. 1 mm. Corinthians 15, for he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Romans 16, 20, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Isn't that amazing? Mm, 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 mm. So here we have Satan. And his the deal is about transforming everybody, right? With corrupt seed. Think about DNA, all the changes they're doing with DNA. That's how it's going to happen. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's corruption enough, right? This number five, transformation, us being transformed from death to life by Christ, hanging on the tree, being taken down, rising again the third day, prophesied 500th chapter of the Bible. I couldn't, I couldn't manipulate this stuff to make it turn out this way. No way, no how. No man can do this. This has to be God. It has to be God. Okay? Um, look at this. The day of Christ. You don't, like, you don't like this. Watch this. Philippians 1.10. That you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until when? The day of Christ. Philippians 2.16. Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice when? In the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. When's our rejoicing coming? The day of Christ. 
2 Thessalonians 2, 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letters from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. We started out with that verse showing you there's five things there. You're not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. Is that the day of Christ is at hand. All associated with the number five. And, you know, the Old Testament calls it the day of the Lord. Here it's called the day of Christ. King James Pure Bible Search software. Download it. Install it. And just do a search for the word Christ. And then look and see how many times it's mentioned in the King James Bible. Take a look at the screen. 555 times exactly. Look at... Mm. I'll give you something else too. Type in the word righteous, R-I-G-H-T-E-O-U-S, and then an asterisk on a Windows keyboard. It's Shift-8, I believe. That means it's going to search for righteous, righteousness, righteousnesses, anything like that. Okay? And look at the number. Slipknot, one of these grunge rock groups. Look at their phrase. If you're 555, then I'm 666. Do I think that the band members of Slipknot counted how many times the name Christ was in the King James Bible and knew that and wrote that? No. Do I believe spirits inhabit people who sing this kind of music and put this in their mind? Yeah, I think it's very possible. Okay? Now, next week, we've looked at Enoch, Genesis 5, all the things that pertain to that. We've seen these, these glorious patterns. The number five, all through the scriptures, relating to the rapture. And you might ask, Pastor, is there, uh, is there a purpose for this? In other, not, in other words, not my purpose, but okay, so okay, we, we agree it's number five. So what purpose does God have in this? What is he trying to show us in relation to this number five? I prayed about this. I mean, I really did because I've, what I'm going to share with you the next time, and I'm not saying I'm going to follow up on this next week. I'm going to seek the Lord on it. But what I'm going to share with this number five and the patterns and why it's all there. I've seen this for years. I won't say that I know it. I don't know it. I, I know it about as much as anybody else knows anything about the rapture. Okay? But I've seen this for many, many years. When God started calling me into this ministry, and it just started working in my mind of certain time prophecies related to this number. Okay, and there is. So what I'm going to share with you, God willing, is what I've seen. I'm not establishing it as the 67th book of the Bible. I'm not saying this is thus saith the Lord. What I'm showing you are the patterns and how I see the patterns where they lead. Okay, so next, next time we do this, we're going to look at Elijah. Because was he not someone being on this earth, alive in a body like ours, and then all of a sudden, he steps into a chariot and is gone in a whirlwind without dying. Elijah did. So we're going to study him. You go. Start with 1 Kings chapter 1. It's in 1 uh, Kings, 2 second, second Kings. 2 second Kings chapter 1, 2 Kings chapter 2. Tell me what you see, all right? And we'll meet back together again and just kind of explore this some more. It's like, you know, some people like going down rivers. I'll, some people like going in caves or just walking down paths in the woods. We, we are, by our nature, explorers. I like to explore. I like to look around, see what's around me, okay? I like to know the woods that are around me. I like to know where I'm at. I don't like to see new places and... I mentioned at the beginning, 
the greatest thing that a person can do with his life is search the scriptures to know God. And it's a, it's a journey, not of, I already know everything. I don't need to see that. I've already, I already know it all. Oh, no, 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 no. Even if you've been down the path once, go down again, slow down. You're going to see things you never saw before. It's that journey that I'm on, that I want to take you on with me and show you the things that God has shown me. Fair enough. You agree with them or you don't agree with them. It is not between you and I. I'm here to give you comfort about what is awaiting us. Because Christ did for me and for you what we couldn't do ourselves. He attained our righteousness. It's 555 times in the Bible exactly. All the forms of the word righteousness, 555, Christ, 555. I love this book. I love this book, and I love sharing it with you, free. Free of charge, okay? Take it, use it. If you like it, spread it around. Give it to other people. All right, God bless you. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.